Pastor Eric, if I haven't met you yet, uh, welcome. We're going to look at Psalm 6 this morning. This is a Psalm of David. The Psalms, of course, were used as the uh, Old Testament people of God's hymn book. Uh, they would use these in worship. And uh, this particular Psalm is a, a Psalm of lament. And it's very appropriate that that we would have space uh, during our worship to lament, uh, to be sad. You know, you're not a bad Christian if you are troubled right now. You're not a bad Christian if you're sad. You're not a bad Christian if you feel like you're about to lose your stuff. During this pandemic, during this racial divide that exists in our country. And I'd even would say uh, to us that if we do not feel troubled, that should trouble us. If we haven't had times uh, during these past three or four months in which we just felt like crying, that should cause us concern. So this morning, we wanted to give our worshiping community a space to lament and to be sad. And this song will help us to do that this morning. Listen to these words from King David. King David, a man's man. Friends, this is God's word. It says this, Psalm 6, beginning in verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night, I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. We'll end our reading there. That's pray and ask God's blessing on the preaching of his word. Father in heaven, we come uh, to you with troubled hearts, asking that you would hear us, asking that you would meet us where we're at, asking, Lord, that you would give us hope, not as the world gives hope, but the hope that you give in the gospel and in the resurrection. We pray all these things through Christ. Amen. It's a pretty horrible feeling thinking that you're going to die. I don't know if You've ever experienced that yet? 
couple years ago, I found myself awake at three in the morning, having an awful pain in my chest, and my mind went racing, assuming the worst. It had to be a heart attack. It had to be a heart attack. But I don't know if it is, I don't know what to do. I just know one thing, I am frightened and I cannot sleep. And I remember sitting uh, in my living room on my couch, just feeling troubled. It was the silence that got to me. You see, my, my house is usually bustling with noise. I have five children. I don't live in a quiet house. But 3 a.m., it's quiet. You can hear the sound of the clock. You can hear when the refrigerator kicks on. I felt troubled. I didn't know what to do. Should I wake my wife up? Should I go to the hospital? What should I do? I can't think of a more awful feeling than that. Thankfully, I'm still here. So I later found out it was a serious bout of acid reflux. A simple pill would solve that problem. But there's nothing worse than feeling like you're going to die. To feel like you are in trouble. There's all sorts of types of trouble. There's the trouble of feeling like you're going to die. There's trouble that we experience because of the wrong things that we do. Sometimes we think that we're in trouble with God as a result of the things that we say, think, or feel. Sometimes it's our circumstances, like I mentioned at the beginning. In a pandemic, in a world in which there is so much unrest. Trouble is a part of the human condition, a result of the fall, a result of sin entering our good world. What do you do when you feel troubled? I can tell you what I'm tempted to do. I'm tempted to either try to fix the problem with my own resources. I'm tempted to ignore it and act like it doesn't exist. I'm tempted to go and sit on the couch and binge watching Netflix movies. How do you handle your trouble? What do you do? Who do you go to? What resources do you depend on? Well, it's here in this psalm that we enter into a glimpse of David's heart, a heart that is troubled. And it's here that we see what we ought to do. And that simply is to call upon God. This is a psalm inviting God's people to turn their attention yet again to God. The God who has steadfast love for his people. This Lord, if you look through the psalm, the, the word Lord is repeated over and over. It's the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. That name that, that God revealed to Moses that, that covenant-keeping God, that God who has shown grace to people, to sinners like you and I, to people that are troubled because of his grace. That's it. A people that do not deserve this type of steadfast and committed love. It's this God who David turns to and invites God's people to turn to, to call out to. Why? Because he loves you. Because God loves you. We ought to 
call out to him. But there are barriers to that, isn't there? There are three barriers here in our text. The barriers of guilt. The barriers of sadness. And the barriers of our enemies. Those three things are walls that stand between us and God. That cause us pause to go and to call out to this God who loves us. But he does love you. And if you doubt that he loves you, consider the gospel this morning. The the good news that God became man. That he was born of a virgin. His name was Jesus. He lived an absolutely perfect life. A sinless life. He lived the life that you and I couldn't live. And he went to the cross. And with the joy set before him, he sacrificed himself on the cross for you. Because he loves you. He gave his perfect life to you. So that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And have the hope of living in a world that doesn't have racial divide, that doesn't have pandemics, a perfect and sinless world forever and ever. God loves you, and that love is manifested in the person of Jesus and his work on the cross. God has shown us grace because he's decided for some reason to place his steadfast love on us. That's the God who wants us to call upon him in our guilt and in our sadness and when we face our enemies. That's where David begins in verse 1. He begins with his guilt He says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me. And he will. Every single time. No matter what you've said, no matter what you've thought, no matter what you've done, God says, come and call out to me. I will show you grace. Every single time. How many times am I allowed to go to God in my guilt? Every single time. Do you know anybody like that? Are your friends like that? Are your parents like that? Are your kids like that? No. It's just the Lord. The one who has steadfast Love on you. But that barrier is guilt. And we feel shame. And we go and we run and we hide from God. That running away from God and hiding reminds me of an awful event that took place in my home probably 22 years ago, I think. That's a guess. We had a dog, her name was Phoebe. And we allowed Phoebe to to stay with a a church friend a while, Annette and I went and on some type of adventure. And when we we got back, Phoebe had fleas. And being a a person who didn't want to spend a lot of money getting dogs groomed and so forth, I came up with the brilliant idea that we would buy a razor, electronic razor, and we would shave the dog so that we could save some money. So I shaved Phoebe. I realized that I was not called to be a groomer. She looked absolutely horrible. If you can picture a little Lhasa Apsa, 
couldn't touch the head, you know, with the razor. So it's just full-blown hair on the head. And then the body was just like a, a very smooth skin. And, and then the, and the back just looked bad. It was horrible. And it was so bad that Phoebe the dog knew. She knew that she looked bad. And what did she do? She ran away from us. She, she went and she hid in the closet. And she wouldn't come out because she felt such shame. She, she knew that something was not right. She was troubled. That's exactly what we do with God. He hasn't done anything to us. He hasn't done anything to make us feel shame. He's actually done the exact opposite. He's taken our guilt and he's taken our shame. He did that on the cross. And he says, I love you. I love you. When you feel guilt, call out to me. I'll show you grace. I'll show you grace every single time. There's nothing that you can do to separate yourself from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You can't do it. But we let that guilt, that guilt be a barrier and a wall. When God says, let that guilt drive you to me. When you feel guilt, come to me. Don't run away. Call out to me. Because I love you. And I'll show you grace. God never stands in your presence and points at you and says, shame on you. He never does that. The guilt that we feel, we should feel it. But it should drive us to the Savior. Do you realize there are probably people here, including myself, that we've done something in our lifetime that we feel so much shame and guilt about that it prevents us from living in the freedom and in the love of God. What is it? What is it for you? Call out to him. Have your sin accounted for and forgiven. Experience the love of God. And I tell you, as, as we get that, as we get that God is actually like that, he's a God that shows us grace, he's a God that shows us love, and we can call out to him no matter what, how ought that to impact our relationships with one another? I mean, there is just absolutely no room in the church to shame other people. Because God doesn't deal with us like that. Right? We must call out to the Lord even when we feel guilty. And we must call out to the Lord even when we feel sad. I can't think of any other place in the scriptures in which it describes somebody's heart that's so, so sad. David says in verse 3, I am greatly troubled. Then in, in verse 4, he says, Turn, turn, O Lord, deliver me. Like, save me for the sake of your steadfast love. And then in verse 6, he describes this scene in which he is weary with moaning. He says, every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. And then he talks about his eyes. Have you ever cried, like, really hard for a long time? What happens to your eyes? 
They get red, right? And they get irritated. He says, my eye wastes away because of my grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. David is at a dark place. He is crying because he's sad. Aren't you supposed to be strong? Isn't it weak to cry? Maybe you heard that growing up. But here the king of God's people is one who says, I lay on my couch and I cried like a baby. It's heartbreaking to see your kids cry. If you're a parent, you know what I'm saying. I mean, everybody has their playground experience. Your kid's at the playground, you know. You see another kid do something mean. And then your child tries to be brave and tries to act like it didn't really hurt them. And they come over to you and their eyes are just swelling up. And then in a a moment, they just let it out. Every parent has has seen that. And it, it breaks your heart, doesn't it? Do you know that your God is like that? That there's not one single tear that he does not see that comes out of your eyes. It breaks God's heart when our hearts are broken. You are loved that much. Why would we let sadness Why would we let a sad heart prevent us from calling out to such a wonderful God who loves us? Let it out. David says he hears your tears. Every single one of them. And we go through life trying to suppress our hurt and our sadness as a result of living in a broken world. When God says, let it out. Let my heart break with yours. Let me help you. God does not let us take that walk of shame alone. He's there with us. I think we need to let ourselves cry more. Instead of trying to cope, trying to shake it off, call out to God when you feel sad. Let that sadness draw you to Him. And finally, this the psalm that that deals with guilt and deals with sadness ends with hope, which is wonderful. It ends with such a wonderful hope. We must call out to the Lord even in the face of our enemies. You see where David goes? At first the enemies are just pounding on him and he feels guilt And he feels sadness. And now the psalm turns in verse 8. And he starts talking like this. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. My God is going to help me. I've called out to him. He's heard my plea. The psalmist has a renewed hope. 
He has a renewed confidence. And he says, the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my prayer. The Lord accepts my prayer. He's going to show up because he loves me. In the face of the enemy, you can have courage that your God hears the sound of your weeping. He hears your plea and he accepts your prayer. Have you ever faced an obstacle? I'm reminded of a time when I was in college at Geneva, was in a class called Camping as a Ministry. And we went camping and we climbed this mountain. And there was this one difficult section where the, you, the mountain went in and then it came out. And if you could just get over that little hump, you'd be able to do a normal climb. But man, getting over that hump, that was difficult. Nobody in the class could do it. And then it was my turn. That's right, old war story is coming. Somehow, I pulled myself up by one hand. What was that? Anyway, all right. I was gonna ask for a movie reference, but never mind. And I got over that part of the climb and was the only person that climbed the mountain that day. Who gets the glory in that? I do. Right? That, that, that's not what David's doing here. David is saying, I have absolutely nothing that I can bring to this obstacle. I have absolutely nothing that I can bring to this obstacle. I need God. And that's what obstacles are supposed to do. That's what barriers are supposed to do. They're supposed to draw us to God. What mountain are you facing? The courage that God is asking you to have is not in yourself. The courage that God is asking you to have is in Him. To, to call out to Him because He will hear your tears, He will hear your plea, and He will accept your prayer. He will help. Many of us face obstacles, obstacles of fear right now, right? Obstacles of addiction, obstacles of hopelessness, obstacles of finances. What burdens your heart? Let that burden draw you to God and call out to him. He'll hear you because he loves you. God will meet you in your 3 a.m. moment. He really will. When you think that your life is in trouble, when you're sitting on that couch and you feel hopelessness and you feel trouble, God will meet you there. He'll meet you there. Call out to him. Amen. John, come on up and lead us through a confession of sin. I invite you all now to let your guilt drive you to confession in a time of drawing near to the Lord together. Um, let's pray this prayer of confession together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name. 
that our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, amen. In confessing our sins, we can have assurance knowing that the Lord delights in forgiving his people. Listen to 1 Timothy 1.15 and 1 Peter 2.24 as we are assured of the forgiveness we have in Christ this morning. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be free from sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. Alleluia. Amen. As we transition into a time of offering, I invite you to remember that we are invited to give our whole lives to God because we have been given everything in Christ. For those of you who are choosing to give financially this morning, you are welcome to do so in the back, in the offering boxes, or online at our church website. Let's humble our hearts now together as Jordan leads us in our offering song. Mm-hmm. 